So the question is, how many guitar tracks should you be recording when recording your rhythm guitars? Should you dual track? Should you quad track? And also, is it okay to clip your guitars on the way in? Welcome to Viewer Questions Answered, episode 31. So without any further ado, let's jump into this excellent, excellent group of questions submitted by my loyal subscribers. And our first question here comes from Mr. Darren Weston. Can anyone please explain when and where it's okay to clip your guitars, please? Just a little basic info. Okay, well, Darren, this is an excellent question. And when you say clip, that can mean two different things, at least in my mind. You're either referring to clipping on the way into your DAW. So in other words, actually redlining and creating distortion on the way into your DAW. That's one way of doing it. Another way is to clip an analog preamp on purpose. In other words, overdrive the analog preamp, microphone preamp on the way in on purpose. And then finally, you could use like a clipper plugin or something that's actually an insert in your mix. And let me just say this. This is just my approach. I avoid clipping guitars at all costs. The only time that this might be kind of an exception for me is if I intentionally add saturation to my guitars within the mix or use some form of clipper to kind of make the guitar sound lo-fi and to add extra grit or maybe add a little bit of character to like a, a cleaner guitar sound or something like that. But there's one thing I want you to understand crystal clear. Do not, let me repeat, do not clip your guitars on the way into your interface. And in this case, I mean digitally clip. It's very difficult to remove digital distortion, if not impossible, and there's just no reason for it. When you're recording at 24-bit, you have more than enough headroom on the way into your interface, and you could at least leave around six to eight dB of headroom, even more, and you'll be completely fine. It's a lot better to record quietly and boost it in the mix than to clip on the way in and have tracks that you can't use. So that's my take on it. In my opinion, I would just avoid clipping at all costs and only use it as a deliberate effect. And again, if you decide to clip an analog pre, which I doubt this is what you're referring to, but I'll just say it. If you decide to clip an analog preamp on the way in, again, I'd only recommend this if you really know what you're doing because the distortion that you introduce cannot be removed later on. Excellent question, and hopefully that points you in the right direction. And question number two here comes from Mr. JS. How do you approach the task of a client drummer insisting on using their own drum set for a recording that needs new heads and other work? How much time would you allot to making the drums recordable. Okay, well, JS, this is an excellent question. This is something that I used to deal a lot when recording a lot of local bands earlier on in my career, and I still record a lot of local bands, but the difference now is I'm crystal clear before I even start a project. In other words, if I'm dealing with a drummer that's difficult and they insist on using their drum set, and in my opinion, their drum set is not usable or maybe they don't have the money to uh, change their heads. I just won't record the band. It's as simple as that, because if that's an issue, then there are going to be tons of other issues. Believe me, tons of other issues throughout the process. That's just going to make it not worthwhile, in my opinion. Now, the good news is most people are cool. And if they're going to you and want to book time at your studio, it means that they trust your opinion and they trust your advice and the way that you approach your productions. So with that being said, if you investigate and realize that the drummer's kit is maybe subpar, I would say just recommend to the drummer to change their heads. Or better yet, if you have a drum set, it doesn't have to be an expensive drum set that you could keep at your studio, like a house kit. In my opinion, that's kind of like the best way to go about it because you can always control the end result, minus the playing ability of the drummer. I have a house drum set at my studio that pretty much every band uses when they come in. And uh, you're gonna laugh at this, but it only cost me $200. It's a used Yamaha Birch Custom that I bought from one of my buddies. And uh, honestly, fresh heads on that thing, it's a killer sounding drum set. And again, I bought it used for 200 bucks. So you don't have to spend a lot of money. That's a, that's a myth. So that's what I would do. Be upfront. If you get a lot of resistance, then take my advice. That means the band is going to be a nightmare to work with. But if they're cool about it, just suggest to the drummer to change his heads. And usually they're pretty understanding and they'll go along with the flow. Or you could just have your own house kit that you have as a backup, and if a drummer doesn't have proper gear, they could use your gear. Excellent question, and let me know how that works out for you. Okay, our next question here comes from Maple Fox. How do you like to track guitars? Do you track one single track at a time, then double them or quad track them, making two or four different recordings? Do you then pan them after that, creating a stereo? I was taught in a course from a symphonic death metal guy to record guitar stereo by making two pan tracks into a folder, which is a bit 
different. I'm sure there is not a right or wrong way to do this really, but what do you like to do? Okay, well, Maple Fox, this is an excellent question. And uh, I'm not too sure when you said the symphonic death metal guy, I'm not too sure if he means you copy and paste a track, which I definitely don't recommend because that is not a true double track. But let me just explain to you what I do. I keep it simple. I record one tight rhythm on the left and a second tight rhythm on the right and I hard pan my guitars. Let me repeat that. I hard pan my guitars and most heavy music mixers do the same. For some reason, I don't understand why, but for some reason people are obsessed with panning their guitars inwards. Now, let me just say this. If I decide to quad track my rhythm guitars, meaning doing four layers, sometimes I'll pan in the second pair of guitar tracks. But to be honest with you, I haven't quad tracked in a very long time. And if I do quad track, it's only to bring out certain parts of the song, like let's say a chorus. So I like to just have, again, one rhythm on the left, one rhythm on the right, and that gives me more than enough size. And also you have a clearer guitar tone because there's less flaming happening between the different performances. So that's my approach. I'm a simple guy. Uh, there are others that prefer to do it the same way. I know guys like Jordan Valeriot do just one left on the right. Uh, Andy Sneap, he used to quad track. Now he does one left on the right. I don't know, for me personally, quad tracking doesn't give me anything that I'm missing when I have one on the left, one on the right. Again, I just prefer the clarity of one guitar on the left and one guitar on the right. But remember, the trick is to hard pan them. Thank you for your question. Okay, our final question here comes from Metal Insights. Do you think that gluing can be achieved with just compression on the Master Bus? Or is it also recommended to glue drums separately as a group and guitar separately as a group before everything is glued again on the master bus? Okay, well, this is an awesome question. Here's the thing. There's a lot more to gluing your mix together than just compression. Uh, for example, room mics on your drum set actually add a lot of natural glue to your overall drum sound because it makes them sound like they're in a room because they are in a room. Sometimes if you spot mic your drums and you don't use room mics, you end up with very separate sounding drums. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up when we're talking about an entire mix is we have to remember a huge, huge amount of the sound of your mix is based on your drum sound. You can completely change the sound of your mix simply by changing the drum sound that you're using. So for me, that's number one, the ambience around the kit kind of adds a nice glue to the overall mix. Yes, parallel compression on your drum bus or also just regular compression on your drum bus can add glue to the kit. And then finally, your two bus compressor or your master bus compressor does add glue to the overall mix. But again, for me, the truth is a lot of the perceived glue, honestly, just comes down to basic balancing in your mix and actually just nailing the compression and EQ on your individual tracks. For me, again, that's where most of my glue actually comes from. So then my bus compressor and the glue maybe on my drum bus and maybe a tape saturator on my two bus, that's just additional glue on my already glued together mix that's glued together at the source. Now on the topic of this, the truth is, most of the sound of your mix comes down to just having a solid understanding of basic EQ and compression moves. And because of this, I'm offering you direct access for absolutely free to my crisp and clear heavy mix formula. The heavy mix formula is comprised of three main components, an EQ and compression cheat sheet, where you'll find clickable links to individual private tutorials for each of the main instruments within heavy mix. And below each of the tutorials, there is a multi-track download so you can access the exact same files that I'm using in the lessons so you can mix along with me. Again, you could have direct access for absolutely free to my crisp and clear heavy mix formula. There's a link below in this video's description. So Metal Insights, Hopefully that makes sense. Yes, a two bus compressor adds glue to your mix. Yes, a little bit of drum bus compression or parallel compression on your drums can add additional glue. But again, remember this isn't a magic bullet fix. Most of the glue comes down to your arrangement, how you treat the levels in your mix, and also the individual processing on the individual instruments within your production. Excellent question and keep it posted on your progress. So I would just like to shout out and thank everyone for submitting this excellent group of questions. Now, if you've submitted a question specifically to my email, just be patient. I'll definitely get to it within one of these videos in this series. If you found this video helpful, like, comment, subscribe, and share. And do not forget to click the little bell icon so you can be notified every time I upload more weekly videos on all things metal and rock production. If you're interested in some Fright Box swag, I've got t-shirts, mugs, and a ton of other cool stuff on the way. There's a link below to the Fright Box merch store 
in this video's description. And again, if you want an EQ and compression cheat sheet, private mixing tutorials for all of the main instruments within a heavy production, as well as a multi-track download so you can mix along with me, there's a link below to my crisp and clear heavy mix formula. You can access it for absolutely free. Until next time, happy mixing. <laughs>